Gary Antonia, and welcome to module seven of our Foundations in Juvenile Healing to Wellness Court Coordination. Uh, this is a cross comparison of operations and case management strategies in juvenile healing to wellness courts. We can go to the next slide. You can advance again. And for those who might just be joining this session or you've been with us throughout this training, uh, my name is Anna Clough and I serve as the co-director of the Travel Youth Resource Center. And I will let my colleague Jacob introduce himself. Hello everyone, my name is Jacob Metoxen. I'm training and technical assistance specialist with TYRC. Thank you, Jacob. You can go to the next slide. So we have had a great time uh, moving through all of our material. I think some of our discussions have gone a lot more in depth than we anticipated. So we wanna thank all of our guests who've been with us um, for their flexibility and for all the sharing um, that we've been able to do over the last day and a half. Um, so for this session, we wanted to talk and share a few more examples of operational juvenile healing to wellness courts. And then we wanted to talk about strategies that we see contributing to full court implementation. One of the difficulties that we've seen, especially during the pandemic, um, just have been the challenges to getting the doors open to your juvenile healing to wellness court or program and really getting the referral process set up so that you can start to invite youth to participate in those services that you're hoping to offer. So we're going to talk a little bit um, about those challenges and hope that you all are able to share. I know if you have been awarded funding um, maybe last year or the year prior and you've been facing some challenges, uh, it's help for us, helpful for us as a TA provider to know, you know, what are those things that you all have been facing? And since we're all in this room together with other um, sites that are also working on implementation or interested or maybe have other juvenile interventions going on in their community. Um, just inviting everyone to share in the conversation and what helped uh, operational sites move into implementation. <clears throat> uh, we're also going to talk uh, about and continue to discuss this community and partner buy-in and some of the things that you all might do to increase that buy-in and to also increase community awareness. So this will kind of be our session to wrap up uh, maybe some of the loose ends that we didn't get to talk about in our previous sessions, and then to also consider some new ideas if you're if you're developing your juvenile healing to wellness court. Jacob, I think I hit everything that we were hoping to talk about this session. Yes, ma'am. All right, we are going to go into breakout rooms. And so you're gonna be assigned randomly to a breakout room. And we just wanna have a conversation in some smaller groups, and then we will come back together in about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, we just wanted to, hit, to have a conversation just about what we've heard so far over this last day and a half, and then come back together as a group and talk about some strategies and ideas. So we'll do that now. <clears throat>
Sorry to my group. <laughs> I said we asked for more time than we got. <laughs> we were having a good conversation, so I'm sure we can continue that in this room as well. So. I didn't get a chance to uh, ask anyone in our room if they wanted to volunteer some of the things we were talking about. So I'll let uh, our other group leaders start if you want, and then I can condense a couple of the things that we brought up in our room. Jacob, do you want to go first? Sure, I'll go ahead. Um, so we're one thing I noticed, we kind of just did introductions then got into brief comments regarding the training. Um, we've got we had a diverse group, you know, from Alaska, East Coast, all the way to the West Coast, Northwest, um, and a lot of different people with different backgrounds, people with different levels of experience within the healing and wellness court. I think Mr. Goodface has just started within the last three weeks, as he indicated, uh, people starting within the last two months. So I think it's a good learning environment for everyone to kind of bounce ideas off of each other. And Betsy, um, you know, talked about the importance of team building. I know she's doing a lot of work within St. Regis. Um, trying to make those connections with the different resources available. Um, and she emphasized the importance of that team building. And I know that's something Mr. Goodface is going to try and build uh, with his court going forward. Um, but yeah, it was just a, a good opportunity to, to learn more about each other and, and see who's um, all in the training and hopefully make some connections, some networking going forward after the, the modules. Thank you. Laura, do you want to share about your room? Yeah, sure. Similarly, we also, um, it was a really great group, a lot of um, a lot of different roles and like lengths of um, experience with the program. So um, good to have a lot of different voices. Um, we also had done intros and then had started, you know, sharing about, about the training and different things that, that folks had found interesting. Um, one, um, I can't remember the name of the forum, but one, one, um, uh, one note um, was that the that uh, form that was had come up during the discussion um, earlier today, Aaron, with you on sort of looking at where to put um, clients, looking at goals, sort of where they're where they're at. That that was a really helpful um, tool that they're looking to integrate um, at White Earth. Um, just general feedback that a lot of questions have been answered during the training, which has been great, and that a topic that there's interest to learn more about is just on working together as a team, collaborative case management, and you know, just challenges due to staff turnover and other, other things going on that um, there's, you know, some people have experienced separation within within the teams. And so that that's been a really helpful topic in an area where continued learning and discussion would be helpful. And then also talked a little bit about um, concepts that might apply and be useful both across uh, tribal juvenile healing to wellness courts and then juvenile drug treatment courts. And just, um, you know, so shared emphasis on team approach, you know, non, a, a way of working with young people that's non-shaming and proactive and non-punitive. So um, those were some of the things that we had started talking about. Jacob, looks like your hand's up. Do you want to jump back in? Yeah, you um got me thinking more, and you guys really got to the meat and potatoes of the conversation. Fortunately, we didn't get weren't able to get to that point. Um, but what Craig um Goodface did talk about that positive energy and having positive people as part of your team, and I really wanted to see if we could talk to Betsy um because the work she's doing is so unique. She's doing purpose area two work, um, and she's working across borders. And her history and experience as a U.S. attorney and a tribal liaison, I think could give some valuable insight into building those relationships. And I'm um, just hearing about the, the type of efforts and strategies she's using to, to build her team. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, some of this I'm figuring out as I go along I've, uh, with a, a liaison in uh, the Northern District of New York, as well as in Montana, in the US Attorney's offices and worked just a lot across border and working with nations on and it's interesting when you do start pairing up with uh, with the tribe on the Canadian side and then also with the people who are ex external to the territory, sometimes you start talking to them and you realize that you're asking for engagement and they've been looking to engage with you. So it's almost like you're you're finding each other and then you can work on each, with each other's energies and and uh, proactivity kind of like what Mr. Uh, Goodface, Craig Goodface said, you know, trying to find the people that are most energetic. 
So that's been interesting is to start into the conversations and then have people be really interested in the work that we're doing. Um, there's also, because we have, you know, two Canadian provinces, the federal Canadian government, the US federal government, that we have uh, New York and, you know, the US federal uh, aspects to our, our people. One of the problems that we find is that we have youth and, you know, Mohawk youth who are in facilities or are in situations where you don't necessarily know that they're there because that they've not been identified as Mohawk per se, they're just a Native American statistic. So part of my uh, work with uh, Jacob has been trying to also look at the indigenous nature of data and statistics and to try and encourage everybody who's at the table to be thinking about what do these numbers mean? So as you're building a program, don't just say, okay, we've got Native Americans, here they are, but you may have Native Americans from other, from other nations that are on your territory. So we've kind of um, been looking at kind of broadly at the program, not just building the program programs, but then also how to measure uh, success and to do it in an indigenous way. Um, so that I would say the bridge building and then also taking a fresh look at and what is indigenous data, what types of measures are relevant in Indian country versus to the grant, to the grantors, you know, the data that you send out. Do we want to package it differently for internal consumption with the tribe? So I, I guess I would just offer that as being kind of the two big points that uh, that we're working on. There's a lot more, <laughs> but I won't bore everybody here. No, thank you for sharing that. I think it's um, awesome to see the levels of collaboration and how you can get people involved in the efforts. And I think, you know, hopefully I see, I saw another comment in the chat, but you know, my hope is that from, from this meeting that we can have a contact sheet. So if people are interested in outreaching one another and learning more about the work or some of the ways you all have been able to increase those partnerships or do that outreach that we could connect with one another. Um, I'm also really encouraged because we've had um, some individuals join from courts that were, you know, we didn't know they were active yet or they, they're moving really close to being active. So I'm really grateful to have all of you here in the room and have been part of this training event. Um, I see we have some comments in the, the chat. <clears throat> from Floyd. I'll report on a room. I'm going to read this chat really quick. Um, the wellness court for our tribe is in its infancy stage, um, has absorbed what's discussed yesterday and today. Lots of good ideas and things that other tribes are doing. So thank you, Floyd. Um, he, they were actually in my room. So um, I have to confess our room first talked about lunch <laughs> and then we moved into a conversation about the training. Um, so one of the things that came up was, you know, what is success in the juvenile healing to wellness court? And um, so I appreciated getting to start a dialogue on that. So is graduation rate the success? Is getting the doors open and being operational the success? And so we had a quick dialogue about that and I think we could have a longer conversation um, but some of the thoughts that were shared were that this process in and of itself for the community is a success because you're building and you're networking and you're growing those partnerships and so no matter the outcome of you know did we get a court open or not open just the growth from from starting those partnership conversations I think is really important and then um, Dave was able to share you know, when you change your change your perspectives, like our our graduate graduation rates, really what determine if this is a successful um, program or not. Um, Dave, I don't know if you wanted to share um, what the thoughts that you shared in the room. I think that's important um, for the group to hear as well. <clears throat> I just mainly said that you know we got to look at the whole bigger picture and look at smaller successes. Um, you know, the things with kids graduating. Uh, high school or or uh, getting their GED working, getting a job, uh, reducing their amount of use, 
um, not reoffending and going into the court systems again. We've had kids that that never graduated our program, but they never really reoffended again. Um, and then one other example I kind of brought up is like in the last few months we've had uh, four kids that I think they're under the age of fourteen that have tried to commit suicide. And uh, who knows if they would have been successful if we weren't involved. You know, we were able to to respond to that crisis, crises, uh, make sure that they got the help that they needed and got them back on track again, you know. So, you know, you don't, you just don't know. You don't, you, you don't know, how can I put that? You don't know what kind of effect that you have on someone's life until later on, you know, you might not see it now, um, but 10 years from now, five years from now, is when you're gonna be able to tell of what kind of effects you had on that child. So, and graduation isn't isn't the big thing. I mean, if they make it, great, celebrate it. But if they don't, you know, and you see them in the community and they're doing well and they come up to you and say, hey, thank you for, for getting me on the right track or making me think, you know, that's that's a big celebration too. So, so that was just kind of my point. Thank you. Um, I completely agree. Um, Jacob, I think you and I shared an article. Uh, it was kind of some similar commentary about a legal clinical program. And the article talked about um, the program director, because this was a grant funded program, saying that the relationships that his students were building with the families that they were working with was really the measure of success success, not the outcomes of the cases that they were actually filing. So I think, you know, if we change our perceptions about what we value, and if that's really relationships and bringing people back into community and trying to connect with each other and build our communities up, build our nations up, I think that changes our perspective on you know, are we being successful or not successful with this program? And I do think, you know, we all want our programs to be operational. We want to make sure that people know about it and that people have access to what we're doing. But just so you know, and, and are encouraged that there's definitely others out there who are doing similar work and facing similar challenges. So I hope that that's an encouragement to you just to to hear that and know that your work is important and it's it's valued no matter what the outcomes are. Um, one other kind of administrative comment that was made was just about um, court forms and things like that. So we have a community that shared that they were pretty close to implementation, but they were kind of struggling with getting forms and things like that developed. So for everyone that's on today, the Tribal Youth Resource Center does offer free training and technical assistance, just like this training that we're putting on today. And so we do have access to shared forms. And then the, the wellness court team has a lot of forms that they share with us. And so if you're working on getting your court open and you're needing some administrative documents or examples of court documents, let us know because we can locate the resource for you if there's not one um, that looks like what you're needing. That's why Jacob and myself, um, we like to use our, <laughs> our court experience. We, I have worked on documents and help people always, always in the context of please talk with your local legal counsel. So we offer resources, we offer support, we do help develop documents, but you should always take those back um, to your community, to your legal staff or whoever that is that you're working with um, and make sure that those are in compliance with your existing statutes or tribal ordinances. But we, we're here to support that. So that, that's our role and we wanna be here to help you with that. So you can email us anytime. <clears throat> All right, so I think we're gonna look at, um, I just took a, a sampling of a few courts I wanted to share about. In light of some of the things we've talked about over the last couple of days. So we can go to the next slide. Jacob, I'm going to talk a little bit about Southern Ute. And I'm not sure if there's anyone from Southern Ute on, raise your hand. I'm not sure if there is or not. I was going to check our registration list before I put this up, but I wanted to share this. Okay, I don't see anybody raising their hand, but if you are from Southern Ute, or you have ever visited their court? I should say not as a 
not as a defendant, but if you're as a defendant as well. Um, so I was very fortunate to meet a judge they had in the past, Judge Chantel Cloud. Um, she actually presented at our 2018 National Tribal Youth Conference. So several years back, I don't think she's serving in the wellness court judicial role anymore, but I've kind of kept track of some of the things that they've been doing ever since I had the opportunity to meet her. And so I included a brochure for their court in the materials because I wanted to bring uh, attention to one of the things that they've done, which is a shortening the length of the track. And we actually had this come up in our room, which was youth don't want to choose the healing to wellness court option because the, the, term is longer than if they just do a normal juvenile sentencing. And that has been a challenge I know in juvenile drug treatment court and likewise it's an issue in juvenile healing to wellness court. And so a conversation that we've been having with OJJDP and other treatment court um, training and technical assistance providers is this conversation about youth have different levels of need. So we need to be adjusting the level of healing to wellness court, the, the track and the phase to match what those specific needs are. So if you have youth that are really only have a moderate um, risk of use level, you're not seeing a lot of really concerning behavior, but you know that there's a level of intervention that could be helpful for them. And you want to keep them from going further into the juvenile justice system. I think it's a great idea. You can look at this six month track and you can actually visit the website. So when you get these materials, go check out the brochures. I think they have a six month track and a nine month track. And we can go to the next slide. I think it shows um, what they do in those tracks. <clears throat> and Antonio, I don't know if you're able to zoom in at all. I'm sorry, the print's really small because this is a picture. Um, so you probably able to view this closer once you receive the materials, but you can see that even though the program is shortened, the phases still include the same activities. So it's just a shorter duration of time, and they're still receiving that those comprehensive referrals to different services. So there's still a team-based approach. They're still getting connected to all of these resources. And there's still this increased investment of time in building a relationship, inviting that youth to get connected with different services that are available locally in the community. Um, one of the things that Jacob and I both noticed when we were reviewing this was um, obtain a fitness assessment. And um, when we, we had this conversation about, about whole wellness and about um, the different dimensions of wellness, we've had these conversations going on at the TYRC and some of our juvenile healing to wellness court dialogues. And so um, I noticed that really quickly um, helping youth, you know, Dave shared multiple times, kids are on their phones, um, they're inside, they're isolated. How can we encourage them to stay healthy get them involved in some fitness activities. And a lot of communities I know are expanding their wellness centers, their fitness centers. And so how can we tie community activities like that into our juvenile healing to wellness court? I know many communities have some running clubs, um, other things that they're able to bring youth into. So just wanted to share that as an idea and a concept that we see happening in, in this court. Jacob, I don't know if you have additional thoughts you wanted to share about that. Yeah, just from the team perspective, I know that's a big topic we've been talking about. Um, looking at Southern youths, um, different members, judge, prosecutor, public defender, case manager, police department. We've been seeing a lot of communities having issues um, with attendance from team members. Um, and I think that's a really great opportunity to incorporate an MOU between all those who are involved with the multidisciplinary team, just to set out some um, expectations, you know, and, and you know, um, I guess uh, consequences if the expectations aren't met or alternatives to communication. Um, you know, if someone isn't able to uh, attend a meeting, uh, send a report, you know, for the group to make a decision, just so everyone is on the same page to get information. Um, and I mean, overall, the education component is a big part of this. You know, we're looking at this as marketing materials. You know, the Southern Ute tribe created marketing materials for the community, for education, 
um, not only for potential participants, but also for staff. Um, you know, going to law school, like I, and I'm sure Anna can attest to this, this isn't something that they're going to teach even attorneys in law school about alternates to justice. And so a lot of times, you know, we're learning on the fly and um, getting your attorneys on board um, and having them look at, you know, these different approaches and getting different perspectives in terms of templates, documents, as Anna mentioned, is going to be huge for, um, you know, your your healing and wellness court success. Um, so I guess that's that's what I see when I look at Southern Youth's efforts here um, in their brochure. Yeah, if you all are able to see that, is there anything that you see them doing that you're interested in bringing into your court or something you would want to know more about? I see I see something I know Chanel shared earlier, the fishbowl prize. I'll let you guys can respond in the chat if you want. We'll leave that up for just a minute so you can look at their phases and a little bit more about the description of their program. One thing I'm curious to, um, oh, go ahead, Betsy, it looks like you unmuted. Well, I, and I, forgive me, I was trying to use the hand thing, raise my hand, you know, officially, but um, we, through our justice strategic planning, we just finished five listening circles with youth, with it running um, ages from 13 to 24, with some of the kids, grad students who are interns for the tribe over the summer. And it was interesting, the education component of the court going and having these youth listening circles. These were just youth, not necessarily, only one of them were they actually the youth that were uh, affected by the external courts. Uh, the rest of them were just youth in high schools, the two high schools that, um, that the tribe, um, where the tribal students go. But, you know, we found that in the school where 67% of the youth or native that none of them, even through high school had not, they had not, not received any training on restorative justice or on the tribal courts as part of a, a court system or justice that could be defined in the territory. So at the end of each of them, with the exception of one of the four groups, we asked, would you be interested in more information about this? Because they, they emphasized how important restorative justice was once they understood what it was about, we gave examples. So I would also say in terms of marketing, if that's the right word, is returning to the cultural um, inclination of them to, to want to participate. All of them said in the four groups that we asked this question, they all said that they wanted more information and that they'd like to be involved in like a peer group or a, a, um, in some way. So we are going to be doubling back to them through our education department to make sure that we give more information as requested so that they understand that they were heard. So that may be something else if people are not doing that is to actually have listening circles um, and kind of put your idea out there to the youth and have them inform you of what they think might be the best approach. I just wanted to mention that. I think that's really important. So part of our general strategic planning for juvenile healing to wellness courts is that component of community feedback and specifically, how are you involving youth in the planning process? And so, you know, what are the various areas that you're going to be bringing in partnerships or different activities activities and you know is that something that youth are interested in especially you know we had this conversation earlier about um, responding to to positive and negative behaviors and these possible rewards or consequences and if you're really trying to see if something is going to resonate with the youth that you're serving I think it's important to actually have a dialogue with them as you're trying to develop those responses and make sure that you you are being inclusive of youth voice and I think that's one of the reasons that we've been bringing youth into our conversations about planning and the different trainings that we put on. So we're like, you know, we're doing this for youth, so it makes sense for us to be talking to them about the things that we're communicating in our training events with prevention staff and, and courts that we're working with across the country. And they really have con contributed, you know, great ideas as far as the work that we're doing. Jacob, you can go ahead. <clears throat> 
Thank you. Um, and you know, you're making me think about uh, you and Betsy making me think about Janelle's role within that um, in terms of making connections uh, with the youth within um, Akwesasne and everything that goes along all the time and effort, the travel that goes along um, with making those connections, having those discussions and then being there for them when they need um, you know, some support. So I don't know if Janelle wants to jump in here and talk about you know, her role within the community and the types of things she's seen and done. Um, to help uh, get the youth youth voice uh, implemented in programming. We love Janelle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Betsy. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate you know being able to share and to listen from all of you and to learn. So, um, so I, I got to be really um, fortunate in the fact that coming as I'm, I am formally incarcerated, and as I was coming out of. In, Transitioning back into the community, I was given an opportunity to work with youth through a ceremony that we have through a rites of passage ceremony. And so I spent the next six, seven years volunteering time to, to organize youth, to deal with their families, to encourage them, to guide them, to speak about prison, uh, things like that, adversities, to be relatable to them. And so I just kind of found my way in through that and then through there, also working in domestic violence, uh, sexual assault, all of that, and then, um, you know, just other initiatives coming along. So what was really important, what was really interesting to me and our findings with the meetings specific to those meetings that Betsy was referring to was that a lot of those kids said that they felt that they a lot of harm came from the school itself, that they didn't feel safe in school, that they didn't like police officers being in their school, that they made them nervous, that they actually get more referrals and more detention in school. So a lot of that behavior already gets initiated within the school system and that they were completely oblivious to their rights as human beings or as indigenous people or really not included on any real, and they wanted to be, which was great. We got to see this really lush conversation happen with young people who don't get included. And then, and then they wanted more. They wanted more because when it came down to talking about, you know, do you know people who are suffering, you know, from, you know, trauma or harm? And they're like, yeah. So they, like you said, they know, they know how people are coping with their pain. They know how they're coping with their pain. And I just felt like, you know, it was really important to get engaged and to create spaces for people who have, you know, taken another route to youth, you know, maybe like, the, you know, not the best route to get back and educate them, but we have lived experiences. And I was just wanting to let them know, you know, that they were important, that they were, you know, that their voices, that their opinions, everything, because it was a real conscious shift to let children teach you who you're supposed to be like my children taught me the kind of mother they needed your children teach you what kind of parent they need and so I was just taking that lead I have three teenagers myself yes I'll say prayers for me because I need them and like I got three teenagers and I'm learning and I've seen other people go through things and I just found like a lot of what people were sharing in here was family family was so important, whether it's a surrogate family, whether it's a, you know, when we start calling each other auntie, niece, it, it automatically builds a connection that's much deeper than coordinator or, you know, price. So it's just different things like that. So it was just really about trying to really make a great effort to, you know, just get, get to, to, to let them teach, you know, I go in there and I say, I work for you. What, 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 do I, what am I doing today? I work for you. Tell me what I'm doing. Tell me what you want. Where does it hurt? What needs to happen? What do you want me to say at the meeting? And they tell me and they love it. They love somebody knowing that they love somebody being there. Like, you know, not, not, I don't know how to explain that, but just really deliberately intentionally trying to wave their hands and saying, I want to be friends with you. I want to be your friend. I, I want to be your sister. I want to know that, you know, that somebody's out there looking out for you. And we all need that because we don't feel safe. We don't feel safe in our homes. We don't feel safe in our schools. We don't feel safe sometimes in search of cultural settings. But if we can strengthen ourselves as human beings and the way we communicate and express our love. So when I go to kids, I tell, I, I tell them I love them and I tell them why I love them. 
and I tell them why they're powerful and I tell them why I'm working for them because I don't have to worry about the future if I invest in the children. I have no future to worry about if I invest in these kids. And so I, that's that's kind of where the, the currency is at, the value for me, the market is in the kids. And a lot of corporations know that because in a lot of these you know, conferences that I've been going through over the years and these, you know, different, there's a lot of corporation invested in getting the attention of children, right? So we're also combating a society that's constantly trying to get your child's attention and then they're distracted, they're distracted, whatever. And not to knock your Jordans or anything, uh, Jacob, but you know what I mean? Like, you know, I, I, I know kids that, you know, would rather, you know, just, and sometimes it just becomes about that, right? Like the Jordans or the newest iPhone or the baddest jerseys or, you know, and there's a lot of kids out there that, that will never have a pair of Jordans and that'll never make it to a basketball game. And, and so I just try to like, you know, weigh all that out and say, you know what, like, it's all good. You know, we can have Jordans and moccasins, moccasin Jordans. I've seen those too. And I just want to say that, uh, you know, so it's just kind of like, you know, getting in there and just being open to learning. I think we all, we all, you can't stay in this game too long or or with some balance if you're not still learning from this generation. And so I just keep, try to stay humble, try to stay vocal, try to let them know I'm here and that I love them. That's my role and responsibility as a member of, as a woman in Akwazasne. And, and I just, you know, do my best to fulfill that. And they feel that they're like, Janelle, you got heart, you got passion. I love it. And I'm like, you, you gave that to me, you know, you put that in me and, and I just, that's, that's my purpose. I'm living my purpose. I'm not lost. I'm not wondering what to do with it all. Like I'm doing, it. I put all purpose behind my pain. And I was like, guess what kids, there's a way out of this. There's a way out of parole. There's a way out of the stuff. There's a way out. Just, you know, keep talking to me. Come on and we'll get there. And, and that's sometimes the sister or the mom that they don't have. So every kid is my kid. Native, not native. That's just the kind of human being I am. Kids are my kids. And I just want to like do my best by them. And that's enough. And, and I know that you all know that it's enough because you're all here, you know, trying to do that as well. So anyways, uh, just thanks for giving me an opportunity to share. And I uh, just, you know, totally love and respect all the work that everybody's doing. Thank you, Janelle, for sharing. Um, and my Jordans have been knocked. So um, I, I look for your name before I shared that information. Didn't see it. So uh, next time I'll, I'll make sure you're not around when I talk about my Jordans. But thank you so much for, for sharing your perspective. It's always valued. It's good to see you. Yes, thank you. Janelle's yeah. Janelle's why I can't go after her because then I'm crying about <laughs> why we're here, why we get up every day, why we keep doing this. And I know Dave shared earlier, you know, if you make the work about them, then you know the next decision isn't that difficult. It's just continuing to come together. And you know, if the if if that youth is at the center of your decision making and why you're doing this work, then you know all this other stuff about the grant or outcomes or this and that doesn't really matter anymore it's really just how can we show up every day and you know be a a good member of our community and contribute back what we know how to how do we know to, to what to contribute you know what do we give and um, we show up we give ourselves and we do the best that we can do with what we have so thank you Jono. always have good words to share and help us to remember what why we're doing what we're doing <clears throat> Um, so we can go to the next uh, slide. And we've had um, Chanel here over time. Oh, wait, this is the next one. I, would, I just wanted to throw both these things in here. These were um, Southern U had some things online of different things that they do in their community. So I thought it would be nice for you all to see um, some of their wellness core activities. So I liked this, the dinner that they were hosting. Um, invitation open to all the members of the community. And then I really liked this um, activity that they hosted. So finding inner peace, self-care and healing. So as you all think about the different ways to bring the community into the conversation or into the work that you're doing in your wellness court, I put both of these in the materials just as a, an idea that you might take and be able to bring into your own program in, a, in the same way or in a different way. All right. Next slide. 
And we, of course, have had Chenille, um, who's been here to share over the last day and a half. And so I put their brochure in here just so you all could uh, look at it. And hopefully if she has an updated version, I think this is one that I found on their website or via their Facebook page. But you should check it out. You can actually go to Facebook and type in Blackfeet Wellness Courts and find out a lot of information about different things that they're doing and get access to their, some of their program materials are, are online. And then I know Chanel shared earlier, if you all wanted to look at their policies and procedures, and um, we're able to do that. So just email us and we can work with you to get you a copy of that. Um, one, one of thing, the things, Anna, oh, go ahead. If I could say something, because I know Betsy brought up data, we're going to be having a data session and the Blackfeet data coordinator is going to be one of our participants at the enhancement training in Albuquerque. Um, so if anyone's interested or will be there, um, you know, we'll, we'll have more information after our module today. Uh, we can go to the next slide. What I really wanted to share, going to, I like these pictures. Chanel actually shared a picture of her team as well. I'm sorry we didn't get to get that into the materials. Um, let's go to the next slide. So many of you may have heard, I don't know if you can raise your hand, have any of you done a community readiness assessment in the past. If you have, raise your hand. I wanted to see if anyone in here had, had worked through that process. Mary Lisa, that's awesome. Anyone else? So this is actually a free tool that you all can access. And the community readiness assessment actually is a great way to bring in members of your community to be a part of the conversations. If you're early in planning and development, or really you could be at any stage of development of your juvenile healing to wellness court. And what the community readiness assessment does is it has you identify an issue or an area um, that you feel like needs to be addressed in the community. And it actually has members of the community come together you develop a set of questions that are specific to that issue, and then you have various members of the community complete that assessment. And then you come back together as a group and confer and talk about some of the ways that you hope to address that issue. We'll include that in the materials, but I know um, Chenille shared they completed that at the very start of their grant. And one of the, the things that came out of their community readiness assessment was um, the, low, the lower level of cultural knowledge among some of the youth that were coming in and how could they increase that cultural knowledge in those teachings and get people reconnected. So one of the really unique things that they're doing in their community, which if you all connect with Chenille one-on-one -on -one, um, can learn more about is the cultural modules that they're developing in their juvenile, juvenile and adult healing to wellness court. And so those modules actually um, include some cultural knowledge and teachings. And as those individuals come in and work through those modules, um, they're actually measuring that increased connect increase in connectedness and that increase in community knowledge and community sharing. And so we did a session with Chanel, I believe, at our last uh, wellness enhancement training or at our National Tribal Youth Conference. We've had a couple of big virtual events. So if you're interested in learning more about um, the completion of their community readiness assessment or the modules that they're developing, I'll share a link in the materials to that session. And then you can also touch base with Chenille one-on-one -on -one if you're interested in learning more about the modules that they're putting together. And I will not, I will or may not put Erin on the spot, but um, I know in the past we've had questions if you are an OJJDP tribal grantee, um, in your performance measures that are reported back to OJJDP, there actually are some specific questions about measuring that increase in cultural knowledge and connectedness. And sometimes we have people ask us, you know, how, how am I able to measure that? Like that doesn't seem measurable to me. There's actually some scales developed by um, indigenous communities uh, that they wanted to measure and see, you know, is the impact of what we're teaching, trying to increase these connections, you know, what is the measurement of when youth are coming in or individuals are coming in, they actually 
developed um, some questionnaires and some scales. And so there, there are some tools that you could look to and look to adapting. And I think Blackfeet Wellness Courts has also done that as well. And so we may bring that into the conversation, Jacob, at the enhancement training. But there's a lot of room to learn about different ways that courts are, are measuring, you know, what the outcomes are for the work that they're doing in the wellness courts. So I'm gonna open the floor there if there's any questions or comments. And Jacob, if you have anything to add, let me know. We have some questions in the chat. <clears throat> Question for other tribes. How do you handle a youth who fails to graduate or complete the wellness court or who is revoked? So I don't know if anyone in here who's working right now in the court how do you handle it when a youth fails to graduate or complete their wellness court requirements? That was um, one of my questions I was gonna ask Dave actually, cause I noticed the brochure stated that, um, you know, detention, additional det detention could be an option. And if Dave, you've ever used uh, that method in terms of, you know, giving additional time of incarceration to youth. Yeah, um, we try to use the least restrictive all the way through our programming. Um, we try everything from uh, writing papers to, you know, house arrest to whatever, you know. But there are going to be kids that are going to be totally defiant, that don't want to follow anything that you're putting in, putting in front of them. So we have gotten to the point where uh, the court system or probation will step in and and do a violation on them and, and have them do a weekend stay. Sometimes that's enough to open their eyes and they come back and they're like, no, I, I don't want to go back there. And sometimes it isn't, um, you know, it's, I don't know how I can put it. Um, we're going to, you're not going to reach everybody, I guess, you know, and you, all you can do is your best to, to try to get them on that right track but they also have to do the work and want to get on that right track. Um, but yeah, uh, there's some things that sometimes we've done, done that extra hold and it's worked and sometimes it hasn't and we've had to discharge and they've had to go the course of, uh, of uh, going back through the court system. Um, just one example of that, we had a kid from out East. Um, one day I was at his house trying to sign him up in the program and uh, one of his uh, lead lead person in his gang drove by, saw me there, and went behind the house and wrapped off nineteen shots. Um, got the kid; uh, he was moving in a good direction, and he was going. We were getting him to change his ways, and after that day and the threats that were made on his family, he went completely the other direction. Even though he knew it, we were there to help him, and and we were going to do what we could. It just wasn't enough. He wasn't scared of the incarceration at that point. He was more scared of keeping his family safe, in my opinion. So, so I don't know if I answered your question well, but you know, there are times you might have to use the incarceration side, but just don't make it your uh, go-to on everything. You know, there's other things you can do before it gets to that point, but sometimes it has to be that way. Yeah, it's always unfortunate, um, but at the same time, we know there's an element, I think, of broader community safety as well that we have to consider in all our decision making, so understandable. <clears throat> all right, we can go to the next slide, Antonio. So I think we're just going to look at a couple of more court examples, and then I think we're going to wrap up this session to get ready for our next session. But um, I have been able to work with the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. I think we had a member of their team on earlier. I don't know if he's still on. Um, so they actually started out uh, as a program. So I don't know if you were on yesterday and you got to hear, but their juvenile healing to wellness program actually operated at the tribe programmatically 
and they were receiving referrals from the State Office of Juvenile Affairs. And then once they received the referral, their wellness operations were solely at the tribal level and really connecting directly with behavioral health, um, their family and social service and then their youth um, activities and programs. And so I just wanted to share that as a, a concept or an idea. I know we, we've had several people share over the last couple of days that their programs are not actually operating in the court system. And as we look to conversations about the future and about wellness court, you know, are we going to see more programs that are continuing to be housed in the court? Are we seeing a transition on the juvenile court side to support services that are happening outside of the court and really housing these programs in youth services or the education department or behavioral health services where we limit the amount of contact that juveniles are having in the actual court system. And so I think that's a great topic for conversation and for consideration as you all continue to develop your programs and think about, you know, where is where is this program or court best situated? And for some communities, <laughs> Your court and legal staff are there and you and you do want to serve as an intervention. And so I'm mean, I am definitely not saying that juvenile heal and wellness court should not be happening in the court. I just want to make that clear. I know that we have several prosecutors and court administrative staff and others who have really brought their juvenile healing to wellness courts to fruition. And actually we can skip ahead one more. I think Antonia, I'll share a little, little bit more about another program we've worked with. So go one more. Um, so the Confederated Tribe of Coos, Lower Umqua, and Sayusla Indians, I don't know how many of you have familiarity with their community, um, but they were funded, I believe, in 2016, and they started out with a court clerk, a juvenile healing to wellness court coordinator, and a tribal court judge that came in later. And um, for them, I think that they, I know when we were initially trying to work on planning and development, it was a really difficult startup, but they got the investment in time of a judge who had previously um, worked with youth and was really an advocate for the program. And so with really just three core staff were able to get their juvenile healing to wellness court launched. And all three of those staff were, were situated in the court itself and their court coordinator was connecting with other service departments and other things that were in the community but really their court staff are the ones who are able to bring the court forward and really get the doors open so i wanted to share this court because one is they had a smaller staff and so sometimes when you look across the board at the different um, juvenile healing to wellness courts, especially ones that are sharing and ones that you see that have a really broad range of stakeholders and staff that are coming in and, you know, we're connected with 10 departments and that's not the case for every community. So I think just being aware that everyone is uniquely situated and that there may be a, a more limited set of resources that are available there locally, but that you can very much get a healing to wellness court started just by having that investment of time with even a few members of the community. So just to share that for you all, if you're getting started and you feel like, you know, we don't have 10 people at the table at every meeting, but we do have four, like, you know, two, three people, four people, that's enough. Like you can get your wellness court started with a small group of people. And I actually think a smaller group can help you as you're trying to get those first kind of policies or procedures and documents and things like that set up. So I think working in a smaller group can actually be beneficial as well. Um, what is that phrase? Too many cooks in the kitchen or <laughs> um, that, you know, bigger group can almost um, hinder progress sometimes. So I just wanted to share their community as an example. And you can visit their website. They also have a peacemaking initiative. So really interesting stuff going on in their court. And if you all ever wanna get connected with them, they have a great court administrator, super um, helpful, loves to share about their program. So I would be happy to connect you with their team. <clears throat> all right. I think we're almost at the end, Jacob, looking at the time. Let's go to the next slide, Antonia. 
So this, this is kind of a final thoughts, Jacob, on the last day and a half. Anything we want to mention before we close out this this module? And I think it's um what we didn't get to talk about was the variety of communities um, represented here and the differences in resources and the ability for communities to be creative and look at what's available to them now. And we've heard that phrase a few times uh, during these last couple of days, don't try to recreate the wheel. Um, there are a lot of resources out there. We've got a lot of access to templates, documents already in place from successful juvenile hill and wellness courts. Feel free to reach out to us. Um, you know, if you have any questions or are looking for some guidance, um, on implementing new ideas into your court um and you know i think uh you know, some communities are more fortunate in terms of location um having access to behavioral health that's a big thing i know when i was working in the court um we'd have to send our juveniles uh you know six hours north just to get the behavioral health they needed um facilities um, that tend to work um, and some communities have access maybe in the next jurisdiction or the next county. Um, so just keep in, uh, keep in mind that there are um, different facilities out there and some of our communities do have access to those or have recommendations to do trainings on site to hopefully increase education, increase awareness of some different practices to maybe bring um, some methods to your community instead of, instead of having to send communities out. Um, so I think that's, that's what I would suggest in closing. Mm -hmm. And Janelle's got her hand. Yeah, I wanted to just share real quickly that, you know, I get to be on a restorative justice council here in Akwazesne, but the northern part of our com community is in Canada. So over there, <clears throat> I'm on our restorative justice council, the diversions, all of that. And um, this one time we had a young girl come in and she, her friend was in a domestic violence, bad domestic violence relationship. And he was coming to like, you know, assault her and the girl was knocking at the door. And anyways, they ended up, um, he, he threatened her. And when she threatened him back and the police showed up, they charged both of them. They charged both of them with assault. So we, and she, her case gets diverted and I'm in this restorative just so she's got charges against her for for trying to keep her friend safe. So anyways, we're like, you know, here's the restorative justice circle, you know, here's here's what it can do, right? And it's all of that, keep you out of the courts. And she felt very like it was unjust for her to even be there. So it was hard to come to a, a consensus where someone doesn't even believe that they aren't, they aren't the one that is, that they're not accountable to the charges that they're being charged with. So anyways, so in that in that moment, you know, I was thinking about, you know, and, and, and working in domestic violence. So what we did is we we named, we partnered up with a radio with our local radio station. And what we did is we took we had her do a PSA, a public safety announcement on domestic violence. And, and we had her write a letter to her friend. So the actual announcement like over the radio was like a, a letter from a friend to a friend talking about you know, trying to help her get out of that domestic violence relationship. And you know what was cool about that? I got her to the radio station. She was all hyped, never been in a radio station. She puts the earmuffs on, says her piece, all of that. And wouldn't you know, the woman, the girl that she was trying to help was in a was in walking into the store one day, ran into this girl's mother and said that she heard what she said over the radio and that she knew she had written that letter for her. And it just made her cry, you know, so there was ways to get people in positions for them to be a part of the public safety aspect of it, to include them and to just pull, pull them back into it. But anyways, I just wanted to share that with you because that's the innovation and creative creativeness that we're working with. And then she's like, I got to do a commercial for a radio station and not thinking that was going to be the result of a restorative justice circle, you know, so there's ways in which we can make sure people feel that they're rewarded in trying to, you know, trying to do the right thing. But anyways, I'm going to keep it moving, Jacob. Thanks. Thank you, Janelle. No, unique and innovation, uh, innovative ideas are always appreciated. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I think, uh, for me, I am so glad that we had this time together over the last couple of days. I know we have one more 
module after this that's talking about um, self-care and I think that's really important. I know we've shared already just in this day and a half, you know, many difficult situations that come up in our work and preparing ourselves to be able to respond to crisis situations and work in the complexities of family and abuse. And I know that there's been other things mentioned, you know, how do we consider child welfare issues and things of that nature. And so we know that this work can be extremely difficult and challenging. So on top of you know, planning and development and great management, just the, the types of work and the relationships that are taking place as you build your juvenile healing to wellness court can really impact, impact us on an individual level. So we would invite you to stay. I think we have a short break. Um, Laura, remind me if we're doing an exercise now or at the end. I think Deb's nope, um, to... yeah, De um, Deborah has a lot of awesome um, exercises planned, I think, for her session. So awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you, um, Deb Hallows. Um, recently, her last name changed. She got married. So I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but she will be joining us in about 15 minutes. So I hope that you're able to stay and be a part of that conversation. But I appreciate all of you and the dialogue that was shared during this session. And if you're interested in learning any more about any of the courts we talked about or connecting with other coordinators, um, let us know because we can get you contact information. So thank you. And we will see you in 15 minutes or so. Yeah, and I just wanted to note, I think we are, we're getting started in 10 minutes, um, just for everyone. So, Sorry, um, 10 minutes. Yep. <laughs> See everybody Thank soon. Thank you.